Good afternoon and welcome to RSSL's fourth webinar in our sterile manufacturing series, Best Practices in Environmental Monitoring. Before we start, I'd just like to go through some housekeeping bits and pieces. If you have any technical inquiries, please can you send a short message in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. Our team will then respond to you directly and try and resolve your issue. Please be aware that we're working remotely, so sometimes there may be a delay in getting to you. During the webinar, RSSL would like to invite you to ask questions, also using the questions box on the right hand side. At the end of the webinar, time permitting, we'll try to answer as many of these as possible. Any we don't get round to, we will answer offline and share them with you all, along with the slides from today and a detailed white paper produced to supplement this webinar. So, welcome to the fourth in our webinar series of sterile manufacturing. Many thanks to the suggestions for this webinar. If your title didn't get chosen, keep a lookout because RSSL hope to, over, hope to offer more webinars over the autumn period. If you didn't attend our first three webinars, don't worry, they're all still available to download on demand from the RSSL website. As many of you now know, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the Sterile Manufacturing Lead here at RSSL. My role is to help facilitate our clients' requests supported by a team of experts. If after the webinar you'd like to learn more about our offerings, please contact me direct via the email or the telephone number that you can see on your screen at the moment. Many of you will have seen our COVID-19 journey and how here at RSSL we've managed to continue with normal service throughout. This has been helped by a great team of scientists willing to change their working patterns to facilitate social distancing. I'd like to take a few minutes at the beginning of this webinar to introduce you to the Pharma Micro team. The team are led by Reg Ferdinandes, Reg has pulled together a team of hard-working but fun-loving microbiologists around him. I'm sure many of you will remember our Dolly Parton challenge from the first webinar. Jamie Tempest, the tall one, and Thomas Gosling work with Reg to pull our new sterility suite together, which is now up and running, as I mentioned previously. Greg Snowden is one of our senior microbiologists who has worked in the industry for many years and has a wealth of microbiology knowledge. He is my go-to person for unusual requests. Aaron Asar looks after disinfectant and cleaning validation and pet requests, supported with Sapna Sharitha, who helps. Beth Thomas, alongside um, training to support the sterility guys, it also looks after our microbial limits and endotoxin levels with Claire Soff. The team is supported by Amon Burke and Danny Laker, and we have an intern this year, Ruby Mitchell, who also helps with the team. I'm proud to work with this team who are based in our Wokingham facility. We support all our clients, both non-sterile and sterile manufacturing, to the highest possible standards. RSSL are able to do this by offering endotoxin testing using the LAL method, the sterility service we launched earlier this year. We can um, support with mycoplasma and hope to have fast mycoplasma by the end of the year. We can support all your raw material testing, as well as routine vial and stopper testing. And our team of experts can also help with those more complex projects, such as cleaning validations, environmental monitoring, which is appropriate to this webinar, and investigative problem solving um, investi uh, investigations that you might come across on your fill finish lines. RSSL can help also help support using our training and consultancy group, 
And in fact, as a thank you for your time, RSSL would like to offer you a discount on some of our one day training courses. I'll send details of these out when I send out um, the post webinar email. I'd like to now introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Tim Sandal. I'm sure many of you have heard of Tim and subscribed to his many publications. Tim has over 25 years experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. Tim is a member of several editorial boards and he has written over 600 book chapters, peer-reviewed papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and is a visiting tutor at both the University of Manchester and UCL. So I'd like to hand you over to Tim. Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome to the webinar and I'm very pleased to be with you um, this afternoon. Okay, so we're going to be taking a look at an old topic, but it's one that now requires um, refreshing and reinvigorating now that we're more aware of um, some of the science behind environmental monitoring. Um, so we're going to begin with looking at what environmental monitoring is and what it is not considering the objectives of environmental monitoring. We're then going to take a look at some of the contamination sources and risks. Then we're going to have a look at some of the aspects to consider with environmental monitoring methods, the extra considerations that can introduce a level of robustness. We're going to take a peek at rapid microbiological methods, then consider the core elements of the environmental monitoring programme. That includes what we monitor, when we monitor, and how often should we monitor? Then we'll have a look at um, what to do with the data that we collect and how some of the information can help us set corrective and preventative actions. And then we'll conclude with a look at profiling microbial contamination and why the identification of the contamination matters and what it can tell us. Um, so to begin with, what is and what isn't environmental monitoring? One of the dilemmas we face as microbiologists is that there's very little regulatory guidance for constructing the program. There is some information in the ISO 14698 standard, which is undergoing revision at the moment. Um, and there's a little bit in things like Annex 1. But most of the program needs to be constructed by the microbiology team. And in setting out um, some best practices in this webinar, um, it's important also to bear in mind that each manufacturing facility is unique. There's variations with the type of process technology, with room sizes, the number of personnel who might be present, whether it's open or closed processing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also important to emphasise that environmental monitoring is not a substitute for poor environmental control. And this leads to two considerations. First of all, you need to get control established first and then use monitoring to verify that your controls are in place. It also stands that an environmental monitoring programme will not be effective if it's actually poorly designed in the first place. If like, say for example, where the samples are taken makes no sense. It's not gonna actually inform you about anything meaningful. So in terms of what environmental monitoring ought to be, um, well, it needs to um, fit with the overall contamination control or biocontamination control strategy for the site. For any manufacturer of pharmaceutical products, it's a regulatory expectation. There is an environmental monitoring program in place and it needs to focus on the multiple contamination sources so we need to make sure that we can assess the risks from people the risk of air being a vector of contamination how materials are introduced into an area 
and where there are water sources. And in building out the contamination control requirements, then we need to have good clean room design, we need to have effective cleaning and disinfection in place. We need to make sure that people are practicing appropriate gowning and that these gowning processes are at least visually assessed and going into sterile areas, then they're actually monitored through some kind of qualification. And also we need to minimize contact of people with product. And that um, may include constructing barriers to minimize that contact. Now as to what the purpose of environmental monitoring is, well, it is to provide information about the quality of the processing environment during manufacturing. It needs to generate data relating directly to a time and event. And this helps us to prevent the release of potentially contaminated products. It should be about preventing future microbial contamination by detecting and reacting to potential adverse events. That's where things like alert levels come in. It also helps us to assess the effectiveness of our environmental controls that we have in place in production areas. And also it helps to provide a profile of the microbial cleanliness of the manufacturing environment. And can also help um, us to assess things like cleaning procedures and so on. So what makes for a good environmental monitoring um, program? Well, an effective environmental monitoring program is one that will be able to demonstrate that the environmental quality is consistently within the specified levels that we're hoping to achieve in terms of microbial bioburden. It can also provide a timely and sensitive warning if the environmental quality or control is becoming or has become unacceptable. It also enable us to initiate a timely planned course of action whenever environmental monitoring results are indicative of this unacceptable environmental quality or control. And that's dealing with excursions or out of limits events so we can respond and start to build in our assessment of risk to product and environment. And an environmental monitoring program, a good program needs to be able to answer the nine questions that are posed on the screen. And this is a very good tool to use to review your environmental monitoring program against. And if you have an environmental monitoring rationale or policy, then the kind of broad principles should be detailed and answered within that. And these are the kind of questions that a regulator might potentially pose. So these include how frequent should the monitoring be? So how often should you man monitor part of a non-sterile or sterile process? How long should the monitoring last for? How are the locations of monitoring selected? And here the inclusion of site maps indicating rooms and process flows and sample locations is very useful. You also want to be able to test the robustness of the cleaning and disinfection practices by viewing it against um, how well the monitoring stacks up. It's very important you describe the sampling procedures and sample handling and who takes the samples. You also need to describe and justify the incubation regime. You want to outline what methods being used for data analysis and trending. You want to say how alert and action levels have been derived at, and outline the general approach that will be taken to responses for action level excursions and upward trends. And also outline who's responsible for what in the overall execution of the program. Now, despite good design of clean rooms, all clean rooms are at risk from contamination. And there are several sources of contamination. It's important to pause and consider those because understanding the sources of contamination is exactly what the environmental monitoring program is about and is designed to detect. So people in clean environments are the greatest contributors to contamination. And there's a number of different 
areas of literature and surveys you can look at that inform about this. But the general outcome is about 70% in a given clean room. Water, where there are water sources, so these will be present everywhere, probably outside of aseptic facilities. And water is a double conundrum because it's not only a vector of contamination through aerosols or by people walking through puddles, it's also a growth source for a wide variety of microorganisms. Air, in the way that the air moves and the direction the air takes, and surface contamination, and that's both from people touching things and moving either their gloved hand or an object from one location to another, or the way that items are transferred into the clean room. So there's some different vectors there that we need to take account of. So based on an understanding of these contamination sources, this informs us as what we ought to be monitoring. So contamination in air, as people can shed contamination into air, as air handling systems may not be optimal in terms of the air direction, or there may even be faulty in terms of HEPA filtration. And also we need to understand that contamination can settle out onto surfaces, and that could be from people or from air currents. And importantly, if contamination can settle out onto a surface within a facility, and that's in, that's in close proximity to the product, then it could also potentially settle into the product or onto product contact components. And although people are supposed to keep services disinfected, um, sometimes they can be negligent at doing this, or sometimes places are hard to reach. So we need to bear these in mind when we're looking at the contamination control and environmental monitoring approaches. Now, how do we monitor? Well, the standard methods are fairly well established, but they do have their own nuances, which we'll have a look at. But the standards are settle plates, which look at gravitational settling, particularly for larger particles as they fall out of the air. And the closer air gets to a surface and the heavier the particle, the more likely it is to fall. Active air samplers that give us an indication of the number of microorganisms within a set volume of air. Contact plate and swabs for surface sampling. Particle counting and the rapid microbiological methods that are emerging as well, which we'll have a look at in a second as well. So although these classic techniques are well considered, we do need to consider a number of aspects about them. So beginning with air samplers, first thing is that there's a number of different air samplers on the market. There are filtration samplers, there are impaction samplers, there are centrifugal samplers and other models. And each of these air samplers works differently. And even different models based on the same design can differ. So when we're selecting an air sampler, we need to know what the cutoff efficiency of that air sampler is. And here we need to take note of something called the D50 value. And the D50 value is the size at which half of the particles collected and half of the particles will pass through the sample. So particles that are bigger than the D50 value are more likely to be collected with increasing efficiency, and particles that are smaller than the D50 value are going to be collected with less efficiency. So we want to make sure that our particle counter can pick up a large, relatively large number of smaller size particles. We also need to note the relative biological efficiency of the sampler, which is a test that will be conducted by the particle counter manufacturer using a bioaerosol bio chamber and the injection of a known number of microorganisms per volume of air. We also need to make sure that operating the air sampler doesn't lead to excessive dehydration of the culture media. It also stands that uh, air samplers can disrupt the air stream so particularly where air samplers are used in unidirectional airflow devices, and very importantly in the context of aseptic processing, we need to make sure that the air sampler does not disrupt the airstream. And there's also going to be concerns about how an air sampler exhausts, and whether the, air, the exhaust has a HEPA filter on it, because air samplers themselves can be sources of particle generation. 
And we also need to understand how often the instrument should be serviced, what happens if the manufacturer needs to calibrate it in between surfaces, and what does that mean for data that's been collected to date. With settle plates, the key consideration is that they need to be placed in meaningful locations. The air sampler is in an, the settle plate is in an inappropriate location, then it's not going to give meaningful data. And in unidirectional airflow devices, then by blowing smoke or conducting airflow visualization studies, then where we get slower air movement or eddying, then we have prime locations to situate settle plates. Another factor we need to consider is dehydration. Exposure of settle plates to harsh and rapid airflow can affect the agon volume. So the exposure time must be validated for each particular condition to avoid over drying, um, which then might affect microbial recovery. Now, EUGMP talks about exposing settle plates for four hour periods. So you need to know whether the plate can be exposed for four hours. And if it can't, then you need to go back to your media manufacturer and discuss things like agar gel strength or the volume of agar that's actually in the pond. You need to be careful about the introduction of settle plates because often settle plates will go into unidirectional airflow devices. You need to be very careful about the way that these plates are introduced into key areas. And if plates are irradiated, as they need to be for aseptic areas, they need to make sure that the irradiation process also doesn't affect the growth promotion properties of the plate. With contact plates, these are effective for flat surfaces and for finger dabs and for garments. And they need to have good uniformity of the dome of the agar plate. And it's useful to also know that um, although contact plates are generally better at recovery than swabs, um, the work um, that's conducted uh, a few years ago showed that um, around 50% recovery is optimal, but it does depend upon the surface that's used. These plates also carry the risk of leaving uh, media traces on surfaces, which could lead to microbial growth unless disinfection, disinfecting is applied afterwards. And it's also important that the media contains neutralizers because there may well be detergent or disinfection residues on the surface. And where you're rotating disinfectants, you need to be sure that the neutralizer will work against both disinfectants used in the rotation. Some companies do use applicators for plates, which can standardize the pressure and standardize the time to create a more consistent sampling. With swaps, these are good for irregular or thin surfaces and for probing difficult to clean surfaces. It's important that the swab is wetted because that enhances recovery. And there's a big difference between um, plain swabs and flocked swabs. And there's a few um, papers been published to show that the recovery from flocked swabs is many times greater than with plain swabs. Um, so it's, it's very important to have done some evaluation of the swab that is actually used. With particle counters, these are useful for assessing um, airborne particle concentrations. And particle counting for classification and particle counting for routine monitoring are different um, activities. Within Europe, we're required to look for two particle count cutoff sizes, both 0.5 micron and 5 micron. Um, and although the monitoring gives us a level of particles, we don't actually know what proportion of those may well be viable microorganisms, but it does give us a indication of what the risk of um, viable contamination might be, especially when we look at the larger size particles, because the larger size particles are more likely to be um, rafts of skin matter, for example, that could be carrying microorganisms. And for things like um, aseptic processing, then uh, the particle counters in terms of providing real-time data can allow a filling operation to be stopped. But for other types of clean rooms and non-sterile areas and in grade C and D clean rooms, um, then again, constructing regular particle counting gives an idea of how well the room is performing 
And if we add in things like recovery rates as well, the cleanup rate testing, this can give us the indication of how well a room can address a contamination event. But with particle counters, we need to be mindful that the data needs to be relevant. Particle counters should be located close to an activity in order to generate meaningful data. To ensure accuracy, these locations should be risk-based, not simply randomly distributed. The particle counter should be calibrated and the calibration standard for particle counters is ISO 21501, of which part four deals specifically with particle counter calibration. Um, it's important that particle counters for monitoring unidirectional airflow devices fitted with isokinetic probes, these are the stainless steel probes, because this can make sure that the air volume going into the counter is the same rate as the air volume from the unidirectional airflow device. The tubing length of a particle counter needs to be less than one metre, otherwise it's been proven there is a drop-off of particles, and the larger the particles, the bigger the drop-off effect. And we need to be mindful that particle counters can be prone to false um, events if we're spraying glove, near, glove spray nearby. And they can also be easily contaminated if something gets into the particle counter. Also emerging onto the market are rapid microbiological methods. The rapid microbiological methods aim to provide data that is more sensitive, accurate and faster when compared with conventional growth-based methods. And one example of such a technology are spectrophotometric counters. And these use advances in light scattering and optics together with analytical software. And these provide real-time data about both general particles and biological activity in the air. Uh, so the instrument counts the number of particles in the sample of air both inert and biological using two detectors. So with biological particles, it's using a fluorescence detector to look for certain biological markers, such as NADH, riboflavin, and uh, DPA, which is the material of, of the bacterial spores. Um, so just an example of what these types of technologies can do, this is some data that I um, collated. So with these charts, the bio readings are in red and the particle counts that could include viable and non-viable particles are in yellow. And graph one shows the normal operation conditions of a clean room prior to a shutdown. Um, the second graph gives an idea of um, the conditions um, during a shutdown period. Another graph shows what's happening during cleaning and another one shows the recovery time. So these are just examples about understanding the clean room and understanding what's going on in the clean room. So it's just additional data and an example of an emerging method. Okay, so let's look at some of the aspects of the program that need to be defined. So first with frequency of monitoring, it's easy with sterile manufacturing because Annex 1 says monitoring needs to be continuous. But for other types of clean rooms or pharmaceutical processes, then we may need to risk assess this. So if we have a large facility, we may want to have a look at a number of factors. And there's some examples of some of the factors on the right hand side of the slide. So, for example, room activity. Obviously, process rooms compared to rooms that are maybe used for equipment washing or corridors and things may have different levels of frequency. We also want to factor in how long the product is exposed for, whether we have open processing, the room temperature, so a cold room may need a lower level of monitoring than a room at ambient temperature, the process stage, we may want to increase monitoring as we move towards the finished product or the final formulation, the duration of process activities, how many people are present in the clean rooms, and whether there's water exposure nearby, because that can, can also create a level of risk. So we need to outline frequency of monitoring by weighing up some of these factors. In terms of the conditions for monitoring, 
um, then it's more appropriate to monitor clean rooms when they are in operation. And here terms like in use, occupied, dynamic, etc., are used. But this should be for the primary data. However, monitoring at rest or in a static state can be useful for benchmarking. So if you did pick up a very strange array of air sample results, for instance, checking the room at rest can help eliminate um, ingress from an adjacent area or a faulty HEPA filter or something. And you might then be able to attribute that, the contamination event, more to people. So there are some other information that can be gained, but for your overall assessment, testing the room to its maximum setting with, with people, with equipment running and so on, is a more robust way of assessing that process. The time of monitoring is important. Uh, now for standard monitoring, for a standard uh, or beginning of the process, it might be that any time is equal case, but there are other times when we want to get accurate uh, monitoring tied to specific events, particularly with aseptic processing. So we want to assess things like the setup of a filling line, we may want to assess the clean down of equipment or the strip down of a filling line, the loading of freeze dryers, the loading of an isolator, or perhaps the operation of a centrifuge or a CIP unit in case we're concerned about particle count generation. Or we might want to target open processing, for example. So considering the time of monitoring is another important step. In terms of for how long monitoring should last for, um, well, again, with um, aseptic um, processing, then we have some reasonable guidance. We would expose settle plates for the entire duration of the activity, but we may well take active air sampling at periodic junctures within the process. Again, for aseptic processing, we target finger plates for things like after a connection activity, and also for people present in areas at random times. We also need to assess any interventions particularly uh, personnel sampling and you may want to sample anything that's been inadvertently touched below after the event because the monitoring itself can be invasive as well. For other clean rooms for non-sterile areas and for grade C and D areas for sterile and non-sterile processing then we do need to make sure our monitoring is for a defined period of time. And the time to be sufficient, the duration to enable active air samples to run so that at least one cubic meter of air is assessed and the settled plates are exposed for a sufficient time. And some organizations will follow the four hours, some will go for one hour, but it needs, still needs to be for a reasonable time to capture the overall significance of the activities taking place. Surface monitoring should also be performed at some point during activities. And often with um, lower grade processing, as I said earlier, it's often considered that um, no given time represents worst case. And if we can be proven that we have equal case, then we can go and target our monitoring at any time. But what we want to avoid is always going out at the same time. It wouldn't look good if all the monitoring was always done on a Monday morning uh, for a 24 hour process that should be greater overview to give that level of confidence. In terms of selecting locations for monitoring, then HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points, is a very useful tool to use. And this is essentially process mapping. And it helps us to focus upon where personal interaction is the greatest, what level of activity is taking place, and whether that's consistently high or whether it's variable, whether contact with critical surfaces can occur, what the flow of people and materials is, where we want to target checks on cleaning, if there's areas in the room that appear slightly inaccessible to make sure they've been, they're being cleaned and disinfected properly. We need to be mindful to make sure that the act of environmental monitoring itself is not contributing to contamination. It might be that sites with a poor history may need to be monitored more often in order to show that we are getting back into control. And again, the HACCP framework guides us to um, determine the areas where contamination might be greatest, but then making an attempt to reduce those contamination levels and then using the monitoring to assess that we have driven those contamination levels 
down. Again, as I said earlier, it's not about monitoring for monitoring's sake. We also need to be mindful of the culture media that we select and use. Um, and there's often a discussion about whether we use one or two culture media. So should two media be used, one to recover bacteria and one to recover fungi, or is one medium suitable? Well, I did a study um, looking at the various factors about using two media or one medium at two temperatures or one medium at one temperature. And it was found that the two temperature model uh, was um, the most effective, but there is obviously discussions around what the temperature sequence should be, low to high or high to low. And it was found out through these experiments that going in at the lower temperature first did not inhibit bacteria and allowed the optimal recovery of fungi. Now this may differ in different facilities, but this is my own research, but it's important to have some kind of rationale of how the incubation regime was selected. With any environmental monitoring program, it's important that monitoring limits are set. So for newly built areas, then regulatory guidance values can be used, but going forward, an alert level needs to be set, even where um, regulatory action levels can be taken, and in non-sterile facilities, then alert and action levels need to be uh, formed. To set limits though, it's important that you select either a good period of time, such as six months or one year, and have a sufficiently large number of samples, ideally more than a thousand, but you could run some processes on um, more than a hundred. And then you want to adopt an appropriate statistical technique, bearing in mind that the clean room environmental monitoring data will not be normally distributed. So two and three standard deviations is generally not reliable. Something like a percentile cutoff approach, in my view, is a more effective way for setting these limits by going with either the 90th or 95th percentile. Review of data is very important because there's no value conducting environmental monitoring without looking at the data. And the data needs to be interpreted to ascertain what the true trends are. And the way you would do that would be through trend analysis. And this is because data often originated from a single sample or event is often not significant. What you need to do is take the broad overview and here graphs, histograms, or even statistical process control charts can be applied to help with the data review process. But with any approach to trending, it's important to define the time period and to include as much information as possible to help to identify patterns. So know the locations, know the dates, know the times, and then you can overlay things like, has the room design changed? Are we suddenly running a new piece of equipment? Have there been any shift or operational changes? Are there new teams of personnel? Is there a seasonality factor? Has there been any deviation raised about HVAC operation, rises in temperature, airlocks not working, and so on? And superlaying this information over data trends can be very useful, and that also helps with out of limits investigations. So the investigation of environmental monitoring level excursions should ideally be covered by an SOP. And there should be a SOP for environmental monitoring and microbiology. A, a general chemistry OOS SOP, for example, would not be suitable. And the SOP should contain decision trees to ensure where possible that the conclusions reached are consistent. So you really want to have a description of the problem or the event. You want to look at trends because you need to take the result you're looking at in the wider context. You may want to take some more data. You need to go and investigate, and that may involve talking to production operators. Um, you need to have a formal risk assessment. You ideally need to determine a root cause, almost probable root cause, because the complexity of microbiological data is it sometimes can be difficult to attribute an exact root cause. You want to consider some kappa, so that's going to be based on one what happened, but it might be a weakness with gowning, for example. And then you need to summarise the um, event and make sure everything is so appropriately 
documented. Springing out of investigations are corrective and preventative actions. And this is where you can link trending to specific events. And you might be able to get some information here, for example, you know, you might find that after a HEPA filter change or a maintenance event, the microbial counts have gone up. So you will need to introduce new controls around engineering for future um, events. You may find that the disinfection regime needs to change. Um, there might be greater control of temperature or humidity, for example, or it may be that um, some aspects of staff training are inadequate. So it's just some examples of some of the campus that can emerge. Now, characterizing microorganisms is of importance, and this is important for several reasons. It can help us look for changes from the norm, and that might signal cleaning or disinfection concerns. We might need to do this in the event of a sterility test failure. And here we may need to use genotypic methods to look for exact matching. Or we might just be able to use identification to help us group microbes into different categories and try and ascertain the origin of contamination. So for example, we find an abundance of gram negatives. This may indicate a water source, for example. It's also useful to take representative environmental isolates and periodically assess the culture media and also sometimes to retrospectively challenge disinfectants to do some additional disinfectant efficacy work which helps build in the contamination control. It's also important not to neglect the importance of personnel training in relation to environmental monitoring. We need to make sure the people taking the samples are suitably trained in the sampling techniques and they're familiar with the layout of the facility, the program and the objectives of the environmental monitoring program. So again, we shouldn't forget that um, people need to be well trained in taking samples. We also need to consider data integrity. Data integrity impacts as much on environmental monitoring as it does on other activities. So data integrity is about the accuracy and consistency of data and this applies to environmental monitoring whether or not we're using computerized systems. So if you take plates, for example, and you look at the picture of the plate on the screen, it's important that the sample data is captured and the sample is taken in the process areas and that the plates not crack because that could lead to a loss of data. It's also important that information is recorded contemporaneously, who took it, when, etc. And also to know that the people counting plates are able to read colonies, that they've been trained. They can tell the difference between merged and spreading colonies, for example. And this also leads into a debate about whether or not a second read is necessary. We also need to take data integrity principles and apply those to equipment as well, like particle counters. We need to have good definitions of data. We need to ensure we have good record storage what happens to the raw data? What is the raw data? Is it the information captured on the counter or the printout? We need to ensure that every user of a particle counter has their own unique password. There needs to be different levels, such as an administrator who can only change settings as opposed to the actual user. There needs to be an audit trail. We need to be sure that the clock is reliable and actually matches the clock that, say, any production equipment or rooms are tied with. We need to make sure the data can be stored and retrieved. And we need to have systems in place to safeguard against data being deleted or overwritten, uh, which can happen when buffers are cleared before that data has been printed out and reviewed. Okay, so there's a lot of information that we've um, gone through and you can see how um, sophisticated the program needs to be in order to answer all of the regulatory challenges. But what we've looked at in this webinar is microbiological environmental monitoring as a means of demonstrating whether or not we have acceptable microbial quality in a controlled environment and one that's robust enough to detect changes in a timely manner. So this is all about the collection of data relating to microbial numbers recovered from samples of air, surfaces and people, plus particle data and how much we can signal potential changes to environmental conditions. And 
sufficient data enables us to assess trends over time to try and capture upward or downward changes in the area. And all of this needs to come together as a coherent program so it links to a biocontamination control strategy. And it's very important that this program is documented and there's underlying explanations, be that a policy or rationale to answer many of the questions that I've posed. Because at the end of the day, the microbiologist is responsible for the effectiveness or otherwise of the program. Okay, so I'd like to thank you and I'll pass you back over to Annette. Okay, Tim, thank you for that. That was a very informative uh, outline on the best practices for environmental monitoring. We've had uh, quite a few questions come in, so I'd like to ask a few of those in the time remaining. Um, okay. So we've had one from Eugenius. Um, due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, how likely do you think that future issued guidelines may require the detection and identification of viral particles in critical classified areas? Um, well, there's already um, um, guidance for biologics in terms of um, viral screening and viral inactivation steps. Um, so there's things like uh, solvent detergent um, and nanofiltration and heat inactivation. So it should be that any process that's required to exclude viruses already has one or all three of those technologies in place. And there's nothing special about the novel coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, that makes it any more difficult to kill through these processes than any other virus. Um, products that don't currently require viral control are not likely to need any additional viral control. However, that companies should have good measures in place to protect um, their people working in facilities. Um, and this is where actually one of the safest places to be is in the clean room, because you're already wearing the appropriate clothing and the air change rates are very fast. Um, but I don't think there's anything specific about COVID-19 as an aside from general viral controls. I think we're all getting used to seeing people in face masks. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I've had yes. a, a question from David who's asked, what is the typical pore sizes of the HEPA filters? Um, well, HEPA, filters um, HEPA filters have an efficiency um, rating for particle exclusion. So it depends on the class of the HEPA filter. Um, so there's a European standard PEP filters, which is um, EN1822. And the highest grade of HEP filter is an H14 class filter. And the H14 class filter is designed to filter out 99.97% particles of 0.3 microns larger. So that means theoretically, if there's 10,000 particles in the air, only three particles of 0.3 or larger could actually um, get through. Um, there, and they tend to be used for grade A and grade B areas. Some facilities use them for C and D as well, or other facilities use H13 class filters, but generally pharma doesn't use anything below 13 or 14. Um, the electronics industry use um, finer filters ULAP filters, ultra low penetrating air filters, but pharma doesn't generally use those one because you don't need to filter any further and two that they're, they're very expensive to operate in terms of the utility bills. Right okay thank you. Um, I've had a, a question from Elena that some facilities monitor for anaerobes and thermophiles as part of routine monitoring. Is there any need to do this? Um, probably not, and certainly not for thermophiles. One, um, you just don't find them, and two, they have no ability to, to reproduce. But 
I have I've played around looking for thermophiles and even I've never come across any organisms that are specifically thermophilic. I know some places do handle biological indicators, may do a little bit of monitoring, but as a, as a rule, it doesn't really have anything. Anaerobes generally are a low risk um, for environmental monitoring because they cannot um, reproduce if they're strict um, anaerobes or what we'll call obligate anaerobes. The only area where anaerobes do have a part is where gases, um, sterile gases and sterile compressed air plays a part in relation to the product. So if we're using that to add headspace to vials, if we're, if you say compressed air, or using that to help put stoppers into place, or if we're using nitrogen in relation to freeze dryers, then there may be a role for periodic anaerobic monitoring. Where, where there's greater emphasis is ensuring that, um, in terms of sterile products, is that the sterility test medium can grow um, anaerobes. And although um, Clostridium sprogenes is included in the growth promotion, there's a greater argument for adding what used to be called Propionibacterium acnes, but it's just been reclassified as Cutibacterium acnes to that panel, because that's by far the most common anaerobe associated with people around the forehead and around the hair follicles. So generally EM, no, unless you're using gases. I think there's actually a case for broadening the sterility test medium panel. Okay, excellent. Um, I've got a question from Eugenie saying, will active air sampling interfere with the airflow in a clean room, which would lead to a risk to that airflow? Some, some air samplers do. So I did touch on this a little bit, um, that there's a whole range of different uh, companies who make hair samples and there's a range of different ways they work and they're not all the same. They differ in their particle size, collection efficiency, their biological efficiency. If you've got air samples in, in say, uh, unidirectional airflow devices, the best ones to go for are the fixed head ones. Um, where you are placing air samples, you need to make sure, one, they don't disrupt the airflow by causing turbulence. And you also need to make sure that the air sampler isn't exhausting an excessive level of particles. And in some really bad models, you need to make sure that it's not spinning out bits of agar or small fragments of agar as well. Um, so the thing is that if you're going to go and buy an air sampler, there's a number of questions that you should pitch to the manufacturer of the air sampler, but the actual assessment in the clean room or the unidirectional airflow device is one that you'll have to have a look at yourself. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a question from Richard saying, should action limits be set at the maximum described in Annex 1 or should they be lower in order to take action before you breach Annex 1? Um, there's different schools of thought on this. Um, certainly you need an alert level and the alert level should be the signal that you could be um, about to breach um, the um, action level. Um, I think when you get obviously grade A is um, currently one, uh, when the new Annex 1 comes out it's going to be changing to no growth. Um, with B where the action is typically five, chances are you have an alert at two or three. So I don't really see any value in having an in-between level, you know, an alert and action and then the UGMP level. However, for um, when you get into C and D areas, then the, yeah, there may be some mileage in having something a bit lower, allowing you to take uh, action earlier. But the extent you take action also, I guess, depends upon what's in place for your alert level breaches. Some, some companies just note their alerts and others are almost taking action in the event of the alerts anyway. So it's partly one of definition of how the alerts responded to. And I think it depends on the grade of the clean room and how you are able to respond to that. So I don't think so for A and B, C and D, yeah, potentially you could, especially if you've got very, very good data, you could bring those down a bit to make sure you're not gonna, you can do something before they're exceeded. Okay, excellent, thank you. 
Um, probably got time for a couple more questions. We've had quite a few about powder media fills and particle counting at point of fill. Um, obviously, yeah. people see this as a challenge. Do you have any recommendations about that? Um, yeah, I mean, slightly higher particle levels are allowed, provided you've shown that you've done all you can to minimise the generation of particles and you've done sufficient experimental work to show that those particles are absolutely from the product and are not in any way microbial, which involves monitoring the machine static, monitoring the machine, the conveyor belt running or, or the blow fill seal process without the product going through, then put the product through and, and then also showing that the that you can achieve the necessary recovery time. So one often overlooked um, issue with um, particles uh, is not forgetting not to do the recovery test or the cleanup rate test. That can be quite meaningful as well. But it is possible to put together a case and have discussions with, with the regulator if you can prove absolutely that what the source of those particles are. Okay, um, and I've got a, a question from Judy on particles again. Is there any correlation between viable counts and particle counts? That's an interesting um, subject and, and it's one that's lacking um, a, a detailed study. There are, some people have looked at it and there's some, there aren't that many studies, I think I came across, there's about five that I know of. Um, and I think two of them said there's no relationship and three of them said there was a relationship. The three that said there was a relationship, they had wildly different figures. The one I can remember was um, one from Sweden that it was a ratio of about one to 10,000. Uh, that's 10,000 non viable to one viable. I think the other thing is that research shows that the larger the particle, the more likely there is to be a relationship. Um, so there's often a greater relationship between five micron particles and viability than there is between 0.5 micron particles. But it is an area that um, it is a fascinating question, but it, it's an under-researched um, area and hopefully something will emerge one day that gives us a clearer signal. And maybe some of those rapid methods that we were talking about, and I, and I showed you that spectrophotometric counter, uh, wider use of that technology might give some more reliable data. Okay, thank you, Tim. Well, that's all we've got time for now. Um, thank you all for attending the webinar. I hope you found it useful and we appreciate all the questions you've asked. Any questions we didn't cover during our Q&A session, we'll forward on to Tim. And as I mentioned at the start, we'll circulate those along with the slides and a detailed white paper um, that Tim has written to go in the next day or so. This really is the last in our spring and summer sterility webinar series. And as the world eases out of lockdown, I hope that you get to enjoy what's left of the summer with your family and friends. RSSL shall be running another series of webinars and technical talks in the autumn. So check our website and our LinkedIn post for details going forward. On behalf of the RSSL sterile manufacturing team and RSSL as a whole, I'd like to thank Tim again for delivering such an informative webinar series um, and for you all out there listening to us. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or if you need any support for any projects. We're here to help. Have a great summer. Thank you.